so the research I'm representing today was done in collaboration with Standard Tech Architecture Limited, an architectural firm based out of Toronto, Canada. And it was, like was mentioned previously a second ago, done in co collaboration with uh, Justin Perdue, who himself is an architect. And the goals of this presentation, the goals of the research we've conducted, is very similar to the goals that I'm sure very many of you share, and that's kind of to bridge the gap between empirical research and the design process. And we feel that the tools present within cognitive neuroscience and our ability to measure behavior and, and responses to an environment or a set of stimuli could be applied to uh, help elucidate or uh, add to the design process. Okay, so we clearly have a very intimate relationship with the spaces we occupy. In reality, the vast majority of our time is spent within, within built environments. And architects have a generally general understanding that the decisions they decide to make and their design decisions and the visual features of the space that they design will influence not only our behavior within the environment, but also our experience of the environment itself. Um, say this, it's quite uncommon for architects, at least at this point, to look at those individual features and visual properties within the environment which might influence uh, the experience of space. So by taking a quick look at visual perception and then examining seat preference research, we might get some general ideas of what's involved in regards to experience of space. Okay, so just a quick overview of visual perception. It's typically broken down into three levels. Very low level visual perception, you kind of, uh, you gather the visual primitives of an object that's seen, such as the lines or edges within the uh, stimulus. For this, you create a general understanding of the relationship between those elements in the intermediate stage. And following at the high level visual perception, you, uh, uh, you go from simple perception to cognition. So you get a general sense of what the object or stimulus you, you're looking at, what it is, and the basic semantic representations involved with this uh, object or scene. Obviously, this is a quite simplified sort of explanation of visual perception, and they're clearly not as simple in reality. In fact, uh, more high level visual concepts will oftentimes um, activate more subordinate levels within visual perception. And oftentimes, we said that the gist of the image is perceived first, which in itself will influence uh, visual processes uh, which are more subordinate. Okay, so now quickly taking a look at environmental psychology and visual properties of an environment, uh, let's try to figure out what features, what visual features of an environment lead to certain environments we prefer over others and might shape our experience of space. Research conducted by Kaplan and Kaplan suggests that environments which possess or suggest mystery are preferred. So this notion of mystery is related to the notion that an environment suggests that further information in regards to the environment will be gained if one continues exploration of the environment. In this way, this is related to the concept of knowledge acquisition or information acquisition in regards to your environment. So any uh, environment which research suggests that further knowledge uh, in further information in regards to the environment can be gained by ex further exploration will be preferred. Next, Appleton suggests that prospect and refuge are preferred within visual um, environments. So what this suggests, the concept of prospect is the notion that the environment allows you an unhindered view of your surroundings. So this is somewhat related to the concept of mystery as it allows you to gain and acquire information in regards to your surroundings and update, update your cognitive map and understanding of what's around you. At the same time, environments which possess refuge are also preferred. So the concept of refuge is the notion that the environment provides you shelter from possible predators and and concealment from possible prey. So one can see that these concepts of prospect and refuge can be quite beneficial to our human survival. Finally, finally, complexity also seems to be important in regards to scene preference, and oftentimes uh, the more complex the stimulus is, the more pleasant or enjoyable it will be perceived. At the same time, if um, a stimulus is overly complex, it might be perceived somewhat uh, in an aversive sort of fashion. Complexity also has to do with the fact that the visual stimulus, sorry, the visual system seeks activation, and uh, this way objects which stimulate the visual system will be preferred over those that do not. And once again, this is kind of related to this, um, this basic idea of knowledge acquisition. So more complex stimulus will provide you with more information than a less complex one. Okay, one of the issues between all these studies is, yeah, they're interesting, and they tell us a couple of uh, really interesting things about how the visual properties influence our experience of space. But one of the issues is how to quantify the space. So how do you quantify something such as a mystery? It's difficult, especially for if, the, if one of the goals of this sort of research is to uh, provide architects with a, with a tool or a way to uh, predict how an environment will be experienced. It's necessary for us to have a way of systematically describing the space. We believe that ISOVIS and ISOVIS analysis could be a possible way to describe uh, visual properties of an environment. 
Okay, so what is an isodis? An isodis is two dimensional polygon describing the vis visible uh, area from a given observation point. So if on the left over here you have a little environment, and on the right you have that same environment from a bird's eye view, if the black dot represents your view, your location within the environment, everything that's in red is the isodis. And from this, you can generate several properties of the isodis, such as the total isodis area and the number of vertices within the isodis or the perimeter of the isodis. Isolus is suggests to capture or describe the intermediate level, uh, visual properties of the scene. So describe the general or the general visual um, arrangement of the environment or scene which a viewer is in. And why I find isolus analysis interesting is the fact that it takes into account the presence of an actual viewer within the environment. So it doesn't just describe the geometry of a scene, but it describes the geometry of a scene or a visual um, environment in relation to an actual person being in that environment. Um, previous research in virtual reality environments has suggested that isolus analysis is predictive of experience and behavior within a virtual reality environment. So thus, it suggests that isolus analysis could be used to predict and explain experience of space. So the first thing we did was a slight uh, replication of the VR study in which we tried to see whether such effects could be seen within a real-world environment. So this image here is just an example. It's not obviously done in the real world, so it's just a schematic showing you what the environment typically looked like. And what we did is we had 12 environments, 12 unique environments, and we created these by positioning a number of room dividers in the room, which we measured 9 by 12 meters. We then um, asked participants for each environment to find two locations. One location which would provide them with the largest overview or the best overview within the location, which is synonymous as saying, ask them to find the largest ISO list. And at the same time, another location which would provide them with the smallest overview, the best hiding spot, which in itself is the same as saying, the smallest ISO list within the environment. When they reached those locations, we marked down the locations and generated the ISO list analysis for those specific locations within the environment. And at the same time, we had them perform a semantic differential task. So a semantic differential task consists of a 7.5 polar adjective scale, which is said to measure the attitudes and reactions towards the stimulus. So we measured, um, it would be presented in a form of questions, so something such as how pleasant is the current viewpoint or location, one is unpleasant, seven is pleasant. So this one we were able to measure their perceived pleasantness, interestingness, beauty, complexity, clarity, spaciousness, and sociability of the given environment. So first, if you look at performance, the performance data. So by performance, I mean their ability to find the location within the environment which had either the largest ISO list or the smallest ISO list. We can see that performance was quite good, so perfect performance would be one. What perfect performance would mean is that the location they chose of either having the largest overview or the smallest overview would be the actual location within the environment which had the largest ISO list or the smallest ISO list. So the performance being over 0.8 for both the smallest and largest overviews suggests that uh, this concept of ISO list area is a perceptual reality. So when they enter an actual environment, although they have no idea what an ISO list is, it can still influence how they experience or how they behave within the space. Next, we uh, perform correlation analysis, correlating our ISO list properties of ISO list area and number of vertices within the ISO list to the synaptic differential responses. And we found that ISO list area positively correlated with pleasantness, beauty, interestingness, clarity, and spaciousness, while complexity was positively correlated with, sorry, while number of vertices was positively correlated with complexity. So this is actually, this matches the virtual reality research quite well. And what it suggests is that ISO list area is related to the concept of spaciousness, and perhaps the environments which are seen as being more spacious are seen as being more pleasant due to uh, information acquisition, because they afford uh, the ability for a participant or individual to gain more knowledge in regards to their location. At the same time, the number of vertices seems to be related to the issue of complexity and stimulation of the visual system, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, so does this suggest that we can go ahead and use isolus analysis as a descriptor of the visual properties of space within complex real-world environments? Well, it might be the case, but for us to truly be able to say that isolus properties capture the visual features of an environment, it was necessary for us to take the study to the next step and examine uh, the properties within a complex real-world environment. So take it out of the lab type of st setting and apply it to a natural environment which is being used by uh, real people rather than just participants. At the same time, this also allowed us to examine design intent and whether it was achieved within the space, and hopefully we can use isolus analysis to uh, describe whether or not isolus intent was achieved or how it could be more fully achieved in the future. All right, so the building which, which we performed isolus analysis on was the University of Toronto at Scarborough Student Life Center, which is uh, 
conducted, was constructed, it was, sorry, designed by Stanford Architect and completed in 2004. The building itself features three stack levels and has a total, total square footage of 50,000 square feet. Okay, now if you look at, this is the first floor plan, so the first level of the building. We'll take a look at one area in particular, and that's the cafeteria area. So we can see that the cafeteria, the cafeteria area was intended to be the social center of the student center. So this is where students are supposed to go to engage. So what we did is we led students to this area and we had them rate it on the semantic differential paths that I discussed earlier. So if you look at this polar graph, it shows you their ratings on the semantic differential paths in relation to this location. And we can see that sociability scores, which are up here on the top left corner, are really high. On a seven point scale, this area is rated at 6.2 out of sociability. At the same time, ratings of pleasantness and beauty are significantly lower than several other areas within the space, which suggests that although it was seen as social, the space wasn't seen as very pleasant or enjoyable in relation to other areas within the environment. We also went to the, uh, to the different areas within the building and um, recorded the behaviors which occurred within these spaces. So here, we, this photograph shows the amount of social density, static density, and transit types density, so the people passing through the space. And we're looking at the cafeteria, we can see that the vast majority of behaviors occurring there were of the social nature. So it was indeed being used as a social hub within the student center. Next, we look at the we looked at the second floor, which had quite a different quite a different design intent than the main floor, where the design plan of the second floor was to be an area where students could go to get away from the hustle and bustle of the of the main floor, and thus it was intended to be an area to promote relaxation and individual individual types of behavior. So if you look at, look at the responses on the semantic differential graph, we can see that pleasantness ratings, beauty, and interestingness are all significantly higher than what was found within the cafeteria level. So this place seems to be seen as in a more positive light and is thus perhaps seen as more uh, promoting relaxed sort of behavior and engagement. When we look at the density of behaviors in this space, we can see that the majority of behaviors were of a static individual nature. So design intent was achieved in this respect. The last area we looked at was this newspaper radio station area. We looked at this area because in the, the architect said it was supposed to be one of the more important areas within the space as it was intended to um, be a representat representation of the student body on campus. So it's supposed to be the face of the student body within the building. Um, although the architects had high goals for this location, if we look at the ratings on the pleasantness, beauty, and interestingness uh, scales, we can see that it's actually quite low and wasn't seen thus, thus wasn't seen in a positive light by the student body. Furthermore, uh, this shows that this place wasn't really accessed at all by students or any type of behavior. They didn't even pass through the space, so yeah, definitely failed in respect of being kind of a central area within the student space. Okay, so now what we wanted to ask what, is whether exodus analysis could be applied in this really complex real world environment, and beyond this, whether exodus analysis could be employed by a tool by research professionals to predict or explain how the buildings or spaces will be experienced. So we correlated, again, we correlated isolates properties with the semantic differential paths. And uh, these are just two sample estimates generated by a program called DepthMap. And the program also allows you to uh, get a wide number of isolates properties including isolates area and number of vertices, et cetera. All right, so here we have our correlation results. So looking at isolates area, it was supposed to be a possible predictor of a wide number of factors, including pleasantness, beauty, interestingness, clarity, and spaciousness. In our study, this real-world complex study, it seems that it only significantly correlated with spaciousness and sociability, and those were both positive. So as isolates area increased, the space was seen as more spacious, it was seen as more social. When we look at the correlation results examining number of vertices, which is intended to be a measure of complexity and perhaps even pleasantness, we only found one significant correlation, and that was the correlation between number of vertices and spaciousness, and it was a negative correlation. So, what does this mean? Does this mean that visual features as captured by Swiss properties don't influence our experience of space? Um, I believe what's going on here is the fact that the student center is a complex and dynamic environment. So, yes, the visual features and properties are important, but they're not, it's not the only thing that's going on. And the, and the ISOS properties are probably confounded with a wide number of other factors and features within the space, including the presence of other individuals and previous memory representations formed within the environment. When, when we perform linear regression analysis, for those of you that aren't familiar with what, what linear regression is, it takes a look at uh, the dependent variable, in this example, spaciousness, and you take the, it examines what factors significantly influence the dependent variable. So here we can see that when we perform linear regression analysis on spaciousness, previous experience with the 
building, along with ISO's properties and the amount of social behavior they experienced or saw within the space, all significantly influenced uh, rates of spaciousness. And this is just one example, but this was paced through um, the various linear regression models I created, in which it was never just ISO's or visual properties alone, it was always an interplay of various different factors and properties. So uh, one of the things that's kind of important and this kind of gets at is the fact that the lab environment is quite different from the real world environment. So the lab environment is typically devoid of other individuals. So it's an empty environment that has no people in it. Uh, at the same time, it's an environment which people don't have previous experience with the space. So they just walk into the space for the first time when they're performing a study or conducting an experiment. And finally, the lab environment the lab environments are devoid of function, so they're typically just blank spaces which might have a simple function such as exploration. But this is not the case within the real world. Within the real world, specific areas have very specific functions, and this probably plays a role in how the space is experienced. So uh, this is just kind of the general idea of what might be going on is that the experience of space is not shaped solely by the visual features, but it could be mediated by other factors, right? So what could be happening is visual features of space are influencing building usage and the presence of other individuals within the space, which in turn could influence experience of, the experience of, of, uh, of, of environment itself. So I guess kind of the, the point of all this was to say that, yes, the visual factors are probably very important, obviously. I think it just comes quite intuitively to all of us, and I think the research suggests that visual factors strongly influence how you experience a space or your responses towards the environment, but I don't feel it's necessarily the whole picture. And we need to be uh, uh, cognizant of the fact that other factors, such as presence of other individuals, and even aesthetic choices that you make within, uh, within a building, will all significantly influence one's experience of space. So it's my hope that with continued collaboration between uh, researchers and architectural professionals that we can kind of try to unravel some of these complex, uh, complex factors and get a deeper understanding of what really goes on when we experience uh, complex real-world built environments. Sure, everybody's tired, so no pressure. It's okay. It's been a long day. I'll be out. I'll be out in the lobby if anybody wants to find me. So, but yeah, any questions? Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs>